it's um, my pleasure uh, to welcome uh, distinguished panelists and uh, the audience to this second session of our um, conference on um, perspectives on post-pandemic. Um, uh, yesterday, we heard the Gary Jacobs, who in the opening um, stressed how important and opportune is this subject. And of course, we are all living through through it. Uh, well, we don't. We are not tired of repeating. This is um, perhaps the um, most severe crisis <clears throat> that we have experienced experience in our lifetimes. Um, we all expect it will be a rather short crisis compared to other uh, simmering crises like the environment uh, uh, inequality crisis. But uh, well, it's not not less very very serious. So thanks again for accepting to be part of this panel. And um, we will proceed in the um, established uh, order. Um, I will, um, first of all, <clears throat> ask um, uh, Gilberto um, Galopin uh, from Argentina, who is going to talk about uh, complexity, uncertainty, and bifurcations, the new situation. Um, Mr. Galopin is an independent scholar, uh, and he is a, an associate fellow of the TELUS Institute, uh, ecological systems analyst, scenario builder, and sustainable development expert. He has been a regional advisor on environmental policies at the uh, CEPAL ECLAC, um, a senior fellow at the IISD, a senior expert on environment and development, um, at the IASA, um, executive president of Fundación Bariloche, and last but not least, a fellow um, of the World Academy of Art and Science. Um, Professor Galopin, or perhaps Galopin, I'm not sure, uh, the floor is with you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I will try to keep small uh, in the limit of the time, but I want to make just a, a, a few points uh, related to this issue. Uh, I will try to show. The, the basic point that I want to make at the beginning is that the, the, what is probably unique uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic in comparison with other pandemic we have had is that it came into a world already heading towards a global crisis. Uh, and this is particularly acute in our region. Uh, if this is the case, the history may not be a very good guide for the what we can expect about the evolution and resolution of the current pandemic. In, in the last uh, few decades, we globally and regionally have, have been witnessing um, vast advances in science, technology, and also uh, advances in quality of life, uh, although some in some countries not very fast and in other much faster, and also in GDP per capita. But on the other side, we are also moving along a, a, an unsustainable trajectory, both socially and environmentally, at least. Uh, we have increasing in inequality within countries and between countries. We have a, 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 an environmental degradation that is uh, just the, the, the climate change is just an example, but there are many other ways in which the, our environment is being degraded. And uh, 
Already Latin America, our region, is one of the most unequal regions of the world. And also one in which uh, the environmental degradation is going uh, fast. That has been recently recommended by the uh, book by a number of authors from Latin America, uh, edited by a CLAC, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean of the UN, uh, called the tragedy of Latin America of the environment in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, so this is we are already in a situation we were before the pandemic in an already in an unsustainable trajectory. In addition to that, uh, the new situation, the last few decades, have been uh, witnessing uh, a number of changes and also a number of analyses. Uh, the the so-called Earth system, the composed by the humans <coughs> and nature uh, at the planetary level, is uh, considered by the scientists today to be a non-analog state, meaning that it is in an, a state that has not been different from what has been in the in the history of humankind. <coughs> so, in addition to that, the the situation, the pre-pandemics already shows that a fast increase uh, in complexity, in uh, interdependency and connectivity between factors and country, between globalization and global uh, environmental change and global environmental dynamics, uh, and between many other uh, factors. Actually, the pandemics uh, is probably also one have been uh, facilitated at, very, at the very least by this connectivity and has been dispersed very quickly along the planet. And uh, particularly one of the important things that uh, are being recognized by scientists is that there are at the macro level many uh, hard uncertainties, not the kind of uncertainty that you can eliminate by with more data um, and with some probabilistic uh, analysis, but ontological uncertainty in, in the true indeterminacy in many phenomena of nature and of also society. Well, uh, the, so the, these are things that are very important that really uh, partially confuse the new situation before the pandemic. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the Earth system is clearly an open system and that is maintained uh, far from its uh, thermodynamic equilibrium through the its interaction with the environment, particularly in the case of the Earth system level with the sun. Uh, but this in combination with other uh, aspects of the complexity and connectivity and other traits makes the Earth system and actually any social system, any region, any country, uh, describable as a dissipative structure. Dissipative structure is a, is a structure that is functioning because of its interaction with this environment, is maintaining far from its equilibrium, but also can suffer bifurcations. And, and when the tension with the, its environment becomes too big and too strong to cope, then it may be a, a this rather sudden uh, move towards a higher organization that is better able to cope, but also 
to a catastrophic situation that is uh, the grave. Uh, and this is not just uh, theoretical considerations. Uh, at the level of the air system, uh, scientists have identified a number of climatic tipping points that are uh, situations in which uh, phenomena and processes that they could uh, change drastically and fast and uh, have a, a very important impact on the global climate. One of them is the thermo-aligned circulation of water between the Gulf of Mexico and the, and the Arctic. And the other is the, the Amazon, that uh, Amazonia has, uh, ecologically has a fun function as almost a closed system in terms of water. Uh, it recycles all of this water, and if that that is an also a tipping point. This is below goes below the pressure. Uh, okay, I, I was talking about these uh, tipping points, climatic tipping points. There are there are a number about uh, ten or eleven that have been identified by climate scientists, and there is research going on on the time to identify some uh, social tipping points, uh, possible situations in which uh, moving past the threshold uh, will uh, an abrupt change and important change will precipitate. And in general, those changes are difficultly, they are not reversible or difficult, very difficult to reverse. Okay, uh, so it is uh, it is in this situation with a pre-pandemic situation with those characteristics that I uh, highlighted that the pandemic arrived partially connected with the unsustainable environmental and sustainable trajectory possibly, but and also external factors. And this pandemic has a lot of uh, health, of course, but also economic, social, and political, cultural impacts. And the impacts of the pandemics then are because of the, of the, of the characteristics of, the, of the, our systems uh, of being dissipative systems and being already in a situation, in a trajectory that uh, implies strong tensions with its uh, environment. Uh, and this environment is different according to the level of aggregation we are talking, the air system or a country or a region. Uh, then this, the, the issue here, the problem is the pandemic will be a transient disturbance that uh, there are a number of people that expect, and then, uh, then we'll, we'll be come back to normal. Normal means the kind of normality we have, which is a trajectory which is going on in, into a situation that will be uh, very, very, very critical. But uh, some, some of the analysis uh, that have been published profusely indicate or suggest that uh, we are uh, moving uh, when the pandemic will slowly will be eliminated and, and everything will be back to normal. And other analysis uh, uh, suggest that there will be big, big changes in society and a new kind of reorganization of society uh, will emerge in some cases much better than the than the current one in some cases much worse. 
Well, this is uh, so far. Now, there is in this situation and if the possibility of, of very uh, strong sudden changes and unexpected changes exist, uh, the kind of modes of thinking and acting that we are used to, that have been essentially inherited from the past, uh, may not and probably are not uh, very useful in this situation. There is a, with this increasing uncertainty, the complexity and the possibility of, of um, abrupt changes, the classical thinking that, uh, and, and acting that is uh, based on the presumption of continuity and relative certainty, certainty uh, about the future may not be insufficiently only, but even be seriously misleading. Um, so there is a need clearly, I think, for new modes of thinking and acting uh, that recognize the, the expected, the expected, the unexpected, develop capacity for reaction, adaptiveness, proactiveness, and the search for robust, robust solution and internalize the complexity and connectedness between factors and issues. Um, uh, one example of the prevailing uh, thinking, way of thinking that we inherit from the past is the, is the societal reaction to the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic was was the pandemic was uh, predicted. It was not the black swan, as some people say. It was predicted by scientists many years ago. It was even popularized by Bill Gates in the media five years ago, as he was saying that uh, um, Warner, he, he won in, in 2015, that uh, we are simply not prepared to deal with a global pandemic. And five years later, a global pandemic materialized and the world was unprepared. The, despite the, the, the very important and fast advances in the uh, in the aspect of the study of the of the virus and the vaccine that the, the discovery of vaccines, the world not, has not put in place the necessary capacity to uh, deal uh, globally and nationally with the pandemics uh, in terms of uh, vaccination capacity in terms of uh, deciding which is the best way of dealing and organizing society uh, against the pandemic. So uh, I think this is an example of, of, the, of the difficulties with the classical way of thinking. And uh, this search for the needed forms of uh, thinking and acting uh, requires a lot of things that are not common now. It requires cooperative and interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary research that involves the science, <coughs> sorry, the humanities, the non-academic knowledge, the arts, because uh, uh, it's interesting to think that the 
And for the artist, uncertainty is not necessarily a threat or something to be eliminated. Uh, but often uh, uncertainty is a part of the creative process and is seen as an opportunity. So a, a conversation, a collaboration between scientists and, and artists and, in, and, and, the, and the public uh, or the, 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 the non-academics uh, may be very, very illuminating and useful. Uh, this, of course, requires, will require strong, important re reforms in education, in education, not just learning to learn, which is already uh, widely advocated and also widely practiced, and also <clears throat> in policy making. One of the, uh, for example, one of the major causes of environmental degradation in Latin America have been uh, pinpointed by many scientists as being the disconnect and the uh, compartmentalization of uh, policies. Uh, environmental policies go in, in one direction, economic policies go into another direction that may contradict that. Uh, uh, agricultural policies in a different direction, there is no coordination. And if we are talking about complex problems with many uh, multifactorial, uh, the lack of coordination is almost a sure recipe for, for failure. So, uh, I, that's, this is just an impression that we in Latin America that have a, a long story of co-living with uncertainty and with surprises and instabilities may have something significant to contribute to this uh, debate. And these uh, new forms of thinking and acting will, will allow to identify the collective actions and uh, integrated policies required to steer the future trajectories into a, a, into a, a positive or constructive trajectory that can uh, allow humanity to go forward in in coexisting with the, an environment, actually co, uh, co, co a, a kind of symbiosis and mutually beneficial. And also, uh, it will allow or will point to the high level of solidarity and, and uh, all of the people of the earth. And the pandemic has shown also that <clears throat> in this kind of problems, there is no separate solution, one solution for the South and another different solution for the North. I mean, there is a global solution, or there is no solution at all. That's all I want to share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gilberto. Um, that was a very interesting presentation. Um, we can see well your uh, relationship to EASA uh, in this system, system analysis uh, uh, of the situation. Um, thank you again. Um, so we are going to um, place all questions uh, towards the end of, the, um, of, of this uh, panel. Uh, let me introduce now um, um, Mrs. Rosalia Arteaga Serrano. Um, um, so Rosalia, uh, she is the first um, female who has become president and vice president of the Republic of Ecuador. She also was vice minister of culture, minister of education, and uh, as of now, 
Dr. Arteaga. She is CEO of FITAL um, and president of the Advisory Council of CoFuturo Foundation. She is also a member of the Board of Trustees of the Library of Alexandria. Uh, she is a writer uh, and conferencist. Uh, and of course, she is also a fellow of the World Academy. Um, so um, please, Rosalia, uh, the floor is yours. Thank and thanks you again for much. taking part. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning to everybody. Bom dia, Heitor, e os outros brasileiros que estão aqui. Uh, buenos dias. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I, I want to thank uh, the World Academy of Science and Arts um, to be part of this uh, vibrant panel. Um, the idea today is talking about uh, the challenges of education in post-COVID. And this is a big challenge to talk about it. Um, because uh, there are so many circumstances and crises around the pandemic uh, situation that we must try to, to, um, to center or focus in, in some related to education. But education has to be uh, with every uh, activity in our lives. And uh, of course, uh, we know that before the pandemic, it was not easy. And we are talking about the situation in Latin America. Uh, was a not an easy situation because of uh, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, causes that we had. Economic situation, like in my country, uh, political crisis everywhere. Now we have in Colombia and probably in other parts of our continent. And it is like a conspiracy against education because education uh, was the first one that be cut it um, during this pandemic, uh, students not going to schools. And in most of our countries, uh, the, the students are staying at home. I had uh, an experience uh, and I'm very sensitive about this because I used to be a teacher, a high school teacher during my first time of uh, uh, professional life since I was 17. Then I feel how the teachers are feeling now. And that's probably my biggest compromise to continue working about education and how to improve quality of education. Because it's not only to saying, okay, we are eradicating analphabetism and not uh, illiteracy, but uh, what ca uh, kind of uh, education are we providing our kids and our teenagers and young people even at universities? And um, if we think that we had a crisis before, what happens now and what's going to happen be, uh, after that. Um, for sure, we know that the world is not the same now that it was a couple of years ago, and it will not be um, the same ever. And um, I will propose you to think that we are not going to be back to the normal life. We are not going to be back to um, a new reality, we must improve and create a better reality. That's the big challenge. How we can surprise the situation of COVID-19 and how we can be better. Since the beginning, and I was listening Professor Gilberto Galopin talking about some challenges about environment. During the first couple of months, uh, and people that are concerned about the environment, I had the opportunity to live in Brazil and work like general secretary of the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization. And I had the big um, duty to preserve the Amazon, not only the Brazilian Amazon, but the continental Amazon that is 40% of the territory of, of South America. That's uh, the Amazon, the biggest basin and the biggest uh, biodiversity spot in the whole world. Uh, well, I was uh, listening to Professor Galupin talking about the challenges about climate change and things like that. During the first couple of months, we were thinking that, okay, we are having a big crisis, the pandemic is a disaster, but we, are, we were at, at that time thinking that we are going to improve the, the life, the environment. But it was not true, because we are using more plastic than ever. We are having a lot of troubles more troubles than ever, even in environmental uh, uh, situations. What's happening with the oceans? What's happening with the, with the lands? What we are doing with the species? 
uh, the, the impact that we are producing on environment is terrible, then uh, we have a, a lot to do about how to educate people to live in this world that we want to, to go to a better reality, to a better world. In this sense, of course, I strongly believe that education has uh, the principal uh, effect in, in this. It's not something that we can get from now to tomorrow, because you know, people that work on education know that it takes time, but we are always late to start, always late to start. And how we can manage it? Um, uh, I was uh, trying to think when I, I talk with authorities of my own country, Minister of Education and others, uh, saying we must take advantage for this situation. If we know for sure that exclusion is a big problem because not all the families have connectivity, for example, um, at least uh, in Latin America, people say that from 10 families, uh, from each 10 families, only four families have connectivity. Six are out of connectivity, especially in rural areas, in uh, suburban areas like the favelas or others that we can imagine. Um, then exclusion is a big trouble. Why? Because a lot of, of uh, children, a lot of kids and teenagers are out of the system. And it will be like UNESCO says, like going 10 back a year, 10, 10 back, 10, uh, excuse me, 10 years back, 10 years back um, in education. It will be a disaster, a disaster, a totally disaster in education, but also in economic field, because we are not going to have our population prepared to be part of this, of this century of the, of the of, uh, developing of the world. Uh, what we can do? Well, I propose, let's work with local authorities because the national level is not doing the best. It's not doing the best. They are not improving. Like in climate change, I am absolutely sure that the relations and the decisions to, uh, take it at local level they are more effective than the others that are making or not making the, the, the state government, the federal governments, uh, the national level. Then work with local authorities. That's an opportunity. Every mayor, every governor, every, every leader of a small town can say, we are going to provide connectivity to any kid any um, teenager, any family in our uh, geographical uh, uh, place. Well, local authorities is one proposal. Second, we have to talk about solidarity because the other big problem is devices, devices. The people doesn't have computers, that doesn't have smart, smartphones, they don't have iPads, or if they have, they are not uh, very friendly with platforms. With digital platforms, if you have a cell phone that makes call or, or maybe uh, will serve to chat with the friends, it's not a tool, exactly a tool to, to attend classes, to participate in a classroom. It's not possible. Then I think solidarity, private companies. Now with uh, um, working from home, we know that a lot of, uh, of computers are abandoned in buildings that they are not uh, occupied. Uh, because they are uh, working from, from home. Why big companies are not expressing this solidarity with these kids and these families that they don't have any opportunity to learn if they are, they are not connected? That's the second point. Third point, of course, preparing the teachers. That's another challenge. It's not the same teach when you are in a presential way than teach if you are uh, on, on an online or distant method. It's not the same. You cannot maintain kids eight hours every day uh, uh, seated and uh, listening uh, speak, speaks from, from the teacher. It's not possible. You have to reduce the time that you are, are going to be connected. The link between families and teachers, parents and teachers have to be the strongest, of course. And it's going to be also post-pandemic. Because we are talking, and probably the experts on education can say it, that uh, after this pandemic is uh, going uh, uh, less and less affecting the, the, the life of, of people, but uh, the um, online learning, uh, it came and it will stay forever, forever. 
And probably we have to talk about hybrid methods, uh, disruptive methods that combine the presential and uh, the non-presential. -pres then the teachers have to be prepared for that. Um, well, I'm a dreamer. I love to, to say many times that when I listen Martin Luther King saying, I have a dream, but immediately I have to say, we have a responsibility. I have a dream, but we have a responsibility. That's it. And the idea is why we don't create a, like a kind of task force in Andean countries, we call it a minga, a minga, with everybody participating, the teachers, the state, the local authorities, the private companies, uh, the parents, the family, get involved in this. If no, my dear friends, Latin America is not going to have a future. Listen to me, it's not going to have a future if we are not paying attention of quality of education, not exclusion, uh, tools to, to be part of. Well, probably another good idea would be to involucrate universities on this, on this task. How? Um, students of the last years, they can be part of the solution as tutors of the small kids. Because if you are online, you are a teacher and you have 30, 40, 50, 60 students in front of you, and you don't have the possibility to touch them exactly because you are not in a presential, we can involve uh, students of the last years of university, especially public universities um, that are um, studying because the, the state provides them with free education, at least in most of our countries, in public universities, why they are, they are not part of the solution why the student of medicine cannot be a good teacher of biology? Biology, I, maybe the, the word was not a, a, in a proper way, not teacher, but tutor, mentor of, a, of small kids uh, that they are learning biology. Why the, the student of physics, of mathematics, of engineering cannot be a supportive uh, person uh, in, in, in this kind of alliance that has to be created between ministers of education and um, universities. Maybe that proposal sounds like a dream, but remember when it was a Marshall Plan to recover Europe after the Second World War? It was a crazy thing to, to transport and to, and to put all the efforts to recover? Well, we need a kind of Marshall Plan I call it a Minga plan to recover education in our continent. If no, we are not going to have a future because if we, if we are not preparing the students for uh, the challenges, because uh, uh, I remember that Professor Galopin uh, talked about uncertainties. We are in, in a, in a uh, planet, in a, an environment that is with plenty of uncertainties. We, not, not, we don't have exactly the security about what's going to happen, what are going to be the, fu the future professionals that we need. Then what we need to create open mind students, open mind students, creative students, creative uh, people that uh, can, can uh, dial with all these uncertainties, climate uncertainties, economic uncertainties, professional uncertainties, uh, health uncertainties, uh, how we know that in the future we are not going to have a pandemic? We, we don't know. That's the reason that we, might, we must also, in, with, with other circumstances, to preserve biodiversity in, in places like the Amazon region. We have to preserve like a biggest natural lab laboratory, maybe to provide uh, the medicines for the future, for uh, uh, sickness that still we, we cannot imag imagine like it was the coronavirus in, in these in this, uh, uh, years. But uh, let's think uh, big. Let's think what we can do together because we need to be very creative to um, uh, confront all these challenges. Um, a lot has to do with uh, um, to a strong uh, the public uh, health system in all, all of co our countries, to a strong the public system of education uh, probably this, the next wave could be mental health. What's happening with all these students uh, in, in, in their houses? What happens with all these teenagers that cannot socialize in real 
in, in reality with in real world with uh, with the others and uh, they have only the tools that uh, internet or platforms or, or social uh, networks can provide uh, well the teachers sometimes are the only ones that are, are uh, dealing with this uh, emotional contention with parents with the students with whom uh, the, the parents uh, talk when they have a problem with a kid. They talk with the teacher because this, this is the closer person. I am absolutely sure that after the pandemic, teachers are going to be um, more valorized in society because parents, they know for sure now that they have their kids at home, that it's not easy to have the kids at home all day and be taking care of them and be taking care that they do the homework and they do the research and they can connect and they, they have to do everything. And at the same time to do things at home, then valorizing teachers is a, a big issue that we have to talk in the very close future, not in the future, right now, why we cannot valorize the, uh, teachers. They have really bad self-esteem. I know that because I work with teachers all my life. We organize a contest for teachers all over uh, Latin America. And I know how they feel. Uh, they don't feel that, that the society is paying attention uh, to education and especially to teachers. Then we have to think more about teachers. We have to think more about what the tools we can, we can use to reverse the bad situation to, that we have now. If I know, for example, that in Ecuador, in my country, almost uh, 100,000 of kids, they are not going to school. They are they they get loose for school the teachers don't know where, where they are only in this pandemic situation and only in the part of the andean and amazonic region not counting the coast what's happening in other countries in chile in argentina in brazil the problem is the same then we have to use tools very creative tools let's involucrate local authorities uh, private sector universities and let's all of us talk about education Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, uh, Rosalia, uh, for this uh, very stimulating um, talk uh, about uh, the future of uh, education and the uh, well things that we should start doing right now. I I personally listened with uh, uh, much interest because uh, education and the uh, human capital, yes, as it is also. The, the term is also used in economics uh, is one of my my main subjects uh, of, uh, of research so certainly i hope to talk to you later uh, about uh, about uh, common interests um, well um, thanks uh, antonio again for agreeing to to be in um, a panelist in this panel rather than in the next one uh, so let me um, introduce um, um, Antonio um, de Araújo Freitas Jr. Uh, from Brazil. He will talk about education for an unknown future in the post-pandemic world. Uh, Antonio is a vice president for education, research, and graduate studies at the Getulio Vargas Foundation. Uh, in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. <clears throat> he is former president of the Higher Education Chamber of the National Committee of Education of Brazil. He is member of the Brazilian Academy of Education, former president and consultant of the Latin American Council of the School of Administration, PhD from North Carolina State University. And of course, he is also a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science. Um, Antonio, the floor is all yours. Buenos dias, bom dia, good morning. It's very nice to, to be with, with you here today. And uh, just will be a, a very brief talk about the education for the unknown future. And uh, I, the first thing I thought was about our heritage, what, what we're living to our ch children, to our grandson, to our, grand to our families. We have climate change that will trigger 
that will trigger hurricanes, pandemic, rains, fire, global warming, droughts, radioactive wastes. So we are living a very challenging, a very difficult situation for the young generation. And uh, as, as Professor uh, Galopan and uh, Professor Ortega mentioned, and the education, I guess, education and science are the base for this, any change, any change. Besides of this, we have impacts on the house, economic, public, the culture. So this is, this is a scenario of what we are leaving to our children and grandchildren. The definition of professions and careers are experiencing unprecedented changes, faster, deeper, wider than any other occasion. So what can we teach? What can we teach that everything so changes so fast, no? so deep, so wider? We don't know the future. So this is a challenge. I guess, I just made a guess that to prepare students for careers, we must keep in mind at least four key words, technology, globalization, soft skills, and knowledge. Technology is very clear. Machines are doing the jobs of humans. Artificial intelligence, are working instead of humans. And the, the computers are doing everything. Globalization, the, the, the mobile phone, I think is the, 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 most, the, sim, the most important symbol of this technology today, because with 5G, with, with the mobile, we can do everything, everything. Globalization, globalization for our students. What's globalization? For the companies in our countries, no? is a company is global, if they can leave Brazil, if they can leave Ecuador, if they can leave Argentina and, and be in the United States, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, this is global for a company. For our students, for you and me, for our faculty, globalization is just to take a plane, just to take a, a boat and work in Argentina, in Ecuador, in the United States, in Chile, in Africa. So we, our students need to be a globalist, a gro global profession. The standard of education of our students should be similar should be parallel to those of any country, like the United States, like, like France, Italy. So in a way that the, if they are educated in Brazil, they can just take a plane and go to any place and work uh, as if they were uh, educated there. So globalization is, should be included in our, in, our, in our education. And the, the main inclusion is the quality of education. It's not only education, it's the quality of education. And the, the technology is the powerhouse, is, is, is everything for the future of the working force. If, if you are a medical doctor, if you are engineer, if you are a, a teacher, you must need technology. In my, in Brazil, you may not Brazil, Brazil, has, we have about 50 million students. Professor Rosário Ortega, we have about 50 million students in Brazil. Imagine twice the population of Canada. They go to school every day, every day. They have lunch, they do the homework, they have teachers. So we have about 3 million teachers in basic education, 
3 million teachers. And as you, as you said, we need to train the teachers because everything is changing, is moving. Some of these teachers, uh, they are on labor 20, 30 years ago. So we need to teach the teachers and technology is in the heart of this teaching, in this education. In my school, Getulio Barros Foundation, and when, when we have the pandemic, in about one week, we changed, we changed from face-to-face -to, -face to distance learning. And we are talking about more than 100,000 students all over Brazil. I say all over Brazil because we have a professional education. We have a executive education all over Brazil in about 120 cities all over the country. And this everything was changed in, in a week to do with technology. And the quality I think is about the same, is about the same. And eventually many students, they will prefer to continue with online teaching and some some faculty like me i'm very comfortable comfortable at, to work at home i don't waste time from my house to 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 the school that it's about one hour drive and while one hour back so i stay at home and very comfortable and the, this is i can do that because of technology 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 is in the heart of the future of education and all professions. Soft skills. Soft skills is the human skills. The human skills is everything. In the future, you can imagine that machines, artificial intelligence, robots will do everything at least the hard work. In, in, my doctor is, is make surgery, surgeon in Brazil with robots. They prefer robots because it's better than human being. It's more reliable than the human being. So what about, we have machines, we, we have artificial intelligence, we have robots, so what's left for us? What's left for us is just the human, the human uh, skills, the human, uh, uh, the softest skills. So in the, in the, the softest skills are everything for us in the future and for us. No one can change, can, no machine can substitute a professor that clears the classroom, the enthusiasm, the student. No one can be a no machine can substitute the medical doctor that when he puts the hands on you, just looking at you, you just feel better. So the, the human skills are the skills that you will prevail in the future because no machine no artificial intelligence, no robot will substitute the soft, the soft skills. And the professor Galopin and Ortega mentioned knowledge, knowledge, education, education, and education, science, science, and science. So we need to have knowledge. We need to have education but not a, 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 a soft education. Our education should be similar to those in Europe, to those in North America. So if you want to compete, if you want to, the people to have jobs, imagine that in our, in our airports in Rio, now they, they're put all, all, all workers out of job, 
and the machines are doing everything. You go there, you check in by yourself, you put your luggage. So, and what about the humans? You know, if the machines are doing everything. So knowledge, but high quality knowledge, high quality education. The ability to recall secondhand information. What I, I, I mentioned as secondhand information is information that was produced 20 years ago. Some teachers, they are teaching the same class with the same old papers, all the old knowledge, the knowledge they learned when they were in school. We don't need secondhand information. Or, or better, the young people, our students, they don't need all that secondhand information. It's usefulness. Eventually, they need a basic education. But the future is another one. The situation calls for a continuous stream of new knowledge, new knowledge. So research, investigation is very, very important, no matter what country you are. Investigation, research is quite important. Lots of it, knowledge that cannot be taught because nobody yet knows what needs to be known. Imagine how challenge, what challenge the teachers have today. We need to prepare people, young people, 18 years old, 17, 19, 20 years old, that they will work 10 years from now. And they will have a life span of 40 years working. What can we teach? Think, how can we prepare these, young, these people, these students, without knowing what's really going to hap happen in the future? This is a big challenge. And we need to solve this, this challenge. We cannot teach the old stuff because they need the new stuff that even we don't know. Uh, so, I, I, as I mentioned here and left, we have research. It's quite important that the student, the young student, they do research since of the beginning, even the basic school. Even the basic school. In my school, Getulio Vargas Foundation, all students in the first semester, they do research. And they have prizes and they have a, they will have a national competition that. Also, we'll have the, the, the demography. The demography is, is something that it's amazing because we have very few young people and more and more old people. Demography is changing. So if the young people, they don't have a good education, how, how the country, how the companies will work, will, will have a position. So the demography is quite, quite strange because and maybe 20 years ago, we had lots of young people, lots of young people. The mothers had four or five children and few old people. Now, we have more and more older people, people living 70, 80, 90, 100 years, and the mothers are having less on average, especially in, in, developed, uh, in developing countries. The mothers on average, educated mothers at least, have less than two children. In Brazil, it's about 1.7. So, we expect that in, in by, by 2030, the population begin to decrease. We, have, we will have more older people 
and less young people. So we, if we would not give a top-notch education to these these students, we may have a problem. If it may not. College emphasis need to switch from recall information to new relevant information. Information becomes knowledge. Traditional curriculum blocks the knowledge creating process. The old curriculums, they don't, they, they, they don't, they, they are not a, a lever. They don't leverage new knowledge. So we need to change the traditional curriculum. Everything that can be replaced by a machine will be. Everything. I, I need I, I need at least to finish. It's the almost finished, but the, no, I didn't expect that it will be so so hard in this time. Everything that can be replaced by a machine will be replaced. So the young people should should flew away from all repetitive all repetitive work because everything that is repetitive will be doing by machine so the students should should look for intelligence creativity and human abilities the profession of the future will have to take care of his ability to learn Ability to learn the new things, things that you don't know now, more than preserve old information. The bottom line pur purpose of education is expanding understanding of how the world works. In the real world, the world we are trying to help the student understand, everything connects to everything. So education should be interdisciplinary. How can you teach finance without talking about ethics? How can you teach uh, uh, marketing without ethics? So everything is in interdisciplinary. Uh, if you just think this mobile phone, we have engineers, we have marketing, we have finance, we have everything. So. Education should be interdisciplinary. There is no, no education boxes. So research, creativity, design, and so on and so forth. I want, I ask you, I'm just closing, but I want to, to share with you a little case because I have a reason for that. So let's imagine a little case. Someone, suppose someone wants to a pair of socks. So let's imagine that Galopan wants a pair of socks. Possibly those available have been knitted in Latin America. Power to run the knitting machines is supplied by burning fossil fuels. Burning fossil fuels contributes to global warming. Global warming alters weather patterns. Altered weather patterns trigger environmental, environmental catastrophes. Env env environmental cat catastrophes destroy inf infrastructure. Money spent for infrastructure replacement is not available for health care. Declines in quality of health care affect mortality rates. Mortality is a matter of life and death. Buying socks then is a matter of life and death. So reuse, reduce, recycle. Why is this important? Imagine a, a pair of jeans. If you are use a pair of jeans now, you should know that to make a pair of jeans, we use 10,000 liters of water just to make a pair of jeans. That's why it's so important to use, reuse. One kilo of meat for Pork, meat, use 6,000 liters of water. So we should take real care of our nature. 
because we, we, don't, we don't think about that. It's just a pair of jeans. It's just a kilo of meat. But this is one kilo of pork is 6,000 liters of water. So to make sense of this simple cause effect, that case was about a simple cause effect sequence requires to an understanding of how, of how all fields fit together. So we think that we should think about physics, chemistry, biology, and everything fits together. So it's, it's, it's really a big puzzle. So this little, this little pair of socks, this little pair of socks is, has a real, he, he may have a huge impact on environment. Imagine millions of pair of socks. One minute. Summing up, I think you are more strict with me than the others. Huh? <laughs> the current formal education does not give the students a clear picture. It gives them instead a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but not nothing about how the bits and, and pieces are connected and reinforce each other. To those ends, we move education to system, system thinking that includes ecosystem modes of transport and human body as well as organization. People with the individual qualities will be everything for the organizations of the future. Human skills will be everything for the future is what will be left for us are, are the human skills because machines, artificial intelligence and robots will do the hard job that are doing the, they are done by people today. So everything that can be replaced by machines will be replaced. Thank you very much for your patience. And uh, I, I try to, to make it concise, but uh, we could talk about this all day long, I guess, all of us, because this is a real challenge, science and education. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Antonio. And it was a really a pleasure to, to listen to your presentation. Um, I found it uh, very articulate and interesting, of course. Uh, I hope we will have other occasions to talk more uh, on this subject. Uh, well, this concludes um, the presentation by our three panelists. And we have um, time for, for questions. Uh, I can see already that um, our president, uh, Gary, uh, welcome, Gary, um, to the panel. Uh, he has uh, some questions for um, both uh, Gilberto and uh, Rosalia, at least. Um, so um, if you uh, are ready, uh, you, can, you can speak uh, now. If you allowed me, please, because I have to leave soon, uh, I, I read a couple of questions and it, it will be great for me to answer now. Uh, I just want to know if I can talk now, Andrew. Uh, yes, yes, of course, I understand. Please. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I saw uh, one question about uh, what's happening in India and um, how uh, all the people is getting connectivity. It could be a good opportunity for countries like Latin America because uh, of sure, uh, for course, of course, uh, and for sure, um, we need to jump into uh, and uh, this pandemic that had such an amount of bad things for everybody, for families, losing people, losing families, uh, etc. Uh, but the, in the other hand, we can't make this jump into digital education uh, now, uh, but it uh, needs uh, to have all the supports. And about the, the question of Gary and uh, most of all uh, the, the support that uh, uh, the academy and the world university can provide. I think we can make a task force, of course, and we can join efforts. Uh, we, I, I say that it could be a Marshall uh, plan, but I don't want to use Marshall. Uh, a Minga plan, it will be better because it's so deep in our identity, like Andean countries, for example, talking about the, collaborate, the collaborative work, that's Minga. 
if you need to to build a house and you don't have uh, uh, the money and uh, and things everybody of the of your community help to build that house uh, put in their free work that's that's the meaning of minga uh, then uh, a minga about education that, that is that meaning um, that universities can be um, very solidarity, uh, express the solidarity with the schools and high schools uh, making this approach. We made an experience he here in Ecuador. I'm not talking by, by talking. I, I lead um, a training center for the future that is a school for leaders. Last year, because we uh, did in the past uh, in a presential way, last year we have to commute to a digital uh, system. And we asked the previous students to be the tutors of the new ones. And it was fantastic, fantastic. They uh, were more involved than ever. They were helping not only in the, um, in the situation about homeworks, about the duties that they have, but also in the emotional issue. And that is great. Then we can attack, if I can use the word, uh, the academic uh, field and also the emotional field. And of course, I will be more than happy to talk more about this initiative uh, and try to make it uh, like a, a, a universal uh, instrument to make uh, it better, not a, a new normal, but a better normal, not only a new, but a better normal. With all the experiences that we have in India, in Brazil, I, I listened to Professor Antonio Freitas uh, about what uh, they are doing. And uh, in other parts, of course, we, we must uh, put in relevance uh, the teacher's career. Uh, no machine, no intelligent artif uh, artificial intelligence can do what the teachers can do. It is uh, uh, not possible to, to change in that way. Uh, we must uh, put uh, and reinforce the figure of the teacher and the link between teacher and parents to get it uh, for better, uh, a better situation. Sorry that I have to leave because I have another presentation, but it was really extraordinary to, to hear you and to talk with you. And um, uh, all the tasks that uh, you think about uh, working for education, I will be uh, uh, a person that could be collaborating some of the things that we are doing here in Ecuador or in Latin America. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks again, Thank Rosalia. Thank you. Sorry for have to depart. You understand. Uh, uh, Gary, you have the, the floor. Uh, if you want to, to place your question uh, personally to Gilberto. Well, I'd like to take the... Thank you, um, Pietro. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all three uh, presenters for really superb, uh, insightful, and very complimentary presentations. Uh, and I did put a few questions in the chat uh, before you asked me to, uh, uh, to join in. Uh, I'd like to emphasize just one point before I put the question. I thought that uh, uh, Rosalia made a very important point. We know that change in education or in any field is not easy. And in education, it's, it's made very difficult because of the conservative nature of the educational system, the model goes back for so long. Uh, but this really is an opportunity. The pressure of the pandemic has forced tens of thousands of universities all over the world. Janani mentioned in her comment about uh, India, uh, uh, where have had no experience with online training and education at all. And they've been compelled to go and break through the resistance uh, that there's been since the technology permitted it and made it possible. We now have three uh, uh, organizations, Coursera, edX, and Khan Academy. Each has more than 20 million students around the world. Uh, we know that this can work. It doesn't mean, as Rosalia said, it can be a hybrid. It doesn't mean that it's an alternative to all the traditional institutions. But think about if we can open up the existing institutions in a hybrid manner using all the educational resources that we're not able to tap now. Retired teachers, retired professors, experts from industry and other walks of life who could reach in and contribute to this. I'm just saying, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to really think out of the box and out of the existing paradigm and certainly not preparing just 
uh, to go back. Uh, both uh, Gilberto and Antonio touched on one point that's really uh, a vital concern to the World Academy, and that is the breaking down of the disciplinary silos in higher education, which is such a severe limit to our dealing with the complexity of the real world, which Gilberto uh, did a very good job of, of, of reminding us of. So my question is, uh, uh, what can be done to accelerate this move towards multidisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, not only with respect to complex issues like the, uh, the pandemic, but in all the fields that Antonio was talking about as well, because today we need people who are equipped not as experts in specialized fields, but who understand the totality and the integration between subjects. So I'd welcome comments by either or both of them on this because it's so important. Thanks very much, uh, um, Gary. Um, well, I note that because there are not so many um, people in, in our meeting, it was better um, for questions to be posed uh, just verbally uh, as if we were all together in the same room. Um, now, uh, looking at the, um, here are the questions. Um, let's see. Um, I don't see any other questions uh, other way. Of course, there was a question that was uh, posed by um, our fellow um, Janani, uh, but it was already answered uh, by Rosalia. Um, now, of course, um, perhaps uh, Gilberto, uh, would you like to? Well, for sure, yes. <laughs> Sorry for the. For sure, you need. You you would like to answer to to the questions by by. Gary, uh, so please, you have, How do you, you have the floor. Get interdisciplinary research, transdisciplinary research happening in uni universities. <coughs> I must say that, uh, first I must say that there is a lot of knowledge about the process of interdiscipline and some about the process of transdiscipline that have been studied as a process. So there is, there is knowledge available to do that. Unfortunately, uh, in universities, uh, it's not common. I actually am, uh, I am not aware of any place in which they teach how to do interdisciplinary research. There are a few universities that do interdisciplinary research uh, in some of the particularly in postgraduate seminars and courses, but uh, and some of the universities, like uh, the university, the State University of Arizona, is trying to become interdisciplinary. Although very often it this becomes uh, the attempts of the declaration to interdisciplinarity are really cases of multidisciplinary, in which there is a, a, a number of disciplines taking part of the problem, but there is no cross fertilization. And transdiscipline involving non-scientists is much more rare. Uh, the point is that the academic environment in general is not very friendly for interdiscipline. Even the systems of rewards for the scientists or professors or uh, members of the university is, is geared away in the discipline because of course if you are a researcher and you are working in interdiscipline, you are not working probably in the mainstream of your discipline. And you will be judged and promoted by your contribution in your mainstream. That is the common case. I am not saying that there are exceptions. Regarding this is this thing. I see much, this is happening more, much more in industry when there are people needed to solve a concrete real world problem and there the interdisciplinarity becomes, uh, often becomes a necessity. Uh, either you work in the disciplinary or you don't solve the problem. Um, of course, in academy, there are some areas that now are being developed with a lot of interdisciplinarity, like uh, 
neurosciences for interest. But uh, in terms of what can be done, I think that one of the major uh, problems is the inertia of the whole educational establishment and the members of the uh, establishment, professors, um, in, in maintaining the status quo, because this is what we learn and this is what we are comfortable to do. And one of the things that I, can, I think that could be very useful, and maybe the academy could have a role on that, uh, it is uh, the creating demonstration projects. Projects, maybe modest projects, but they are interdisciplinary that, that tackle a problem that has been already tackled in a traditional uh, manner, and they show to an skeptical audience like in most of the national councils of, of science in most of the country, that this is provides a better scientific uh, solution and understanding. And I, myself, I proposed one to the Council of the Science in Argentina, and it was accepted, but then nothing happened and it was not implemented. Uh, I am talking about small projects, uh, maybe 10 people, 12 people from different disciplines taking a modest problem that can be solved with, uh, with a small group without years of research uh, and of research. And, uh, but they really can show which are the advantage and difficulties of interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary research. And then I, I think in, in addition to that is the importance of uh, educating, educating pol policy makers and decision makers uh, because the, these individual efforts, I think they are very, very interesting and very important, but they normally hit uh, sailing and they, they may be contradicting even uh, national policies on education. So I think it both stronger strategy is small, uh, but the meaningful uh, demonstration projects and uh, in addressing the, the policy makers and the, 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 the places where most policy makers are trained. That's all um, good to me at the moment. Thank you um, very much, uh, Gilberto. Well, we, we are already, we are um, passing the time barrier because uh, we will have another session in less than half an hour. Uh, we have two um, um, panelists who uh, have raised their hands. Uh, first, uh, Eito, um, Gurgolino de Souza, and then um, Antonio uh, Freitas. I will ask both of them to be um, brief in their interventions. Uh, first, uh, um, Professor Eitor Gurgulino de Souza. I, I know that we are, for, the time has expired. But I just wanted to raise one point, which is common to all Latin America, not only in Brazil, but the question of illiteracy. People that cannot read, people that cannot write. Nobody mentioned this issue. And I think it's important, very important. And I, the last one, we need to work on that action plan. Thank you. Well, uh, answer Professor Gary Jacobs' uh, question. Question. I, I think interdisciplinary can be done around the project. Imagine an airplane. Airplane. We to design airplane, we need mechanical engineers. We need need marketing professional, finance professionals, uh, and pilots, and uh, <clears throat> jet professionals. So a bunch of different professionals around the project. Actually, we have in Brazil as a, a university, Universidade Federal do ABC that they work in this way. All courses are around projects, around projects. 
So you are not a professor of, 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 of physics, or you are not a professor of marketing. You are a professor of the University of ABC, ABC, okay? So they allocate you to one project, the students to that one project. So you give classes, but they work. Hence, uh, the marketing, the pilots, and the engineers, they work together to build the plane. So this is the idea, to, to work around a project. So this is interdisciplinary. Maybe the house, the house in India, it would be interdisciplinary. Someone knows how to do the roof and someone do, 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 do the, 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 the water, the, the soil water, the drinking water and so on and so forth. So this is around the project, you can be inter interdisciplinary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio. And uh, well, I believe that we have, uh, uh, we had a very interesting session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 